Hello friends, welcome to The Buzz. My name is Susie Lytle, and on today's episode, we're searching for colors and critters. Some colors are easier to find, like our charismatic bluebells, while others are a little shy, like the flower of the mayapple. And sometimes our eyes just aren't enough. We are also going to be teaming up with some furry friends who can smell the state-threatened ornate box turtles. But search no further. We are going to explore it all together on this episode of The Buzz. Welcome to Messenger Woods Nature Preserve, where each spring this forest floor transforms into seas of blue. Now this preserve was acquired in 1930 and it's never been developed, grazed, or farmed. And it shows with huge trees and high quality habitats. It's a beautiful place to hike at any time of year, but spring is really when it shines the brightest. Spring wildflowers also get referred to as ephemeral plants. Now, ephemeral means something in transition, only lasting for a brief amount of time. These blooms have a fast and furious growing strategy. They want to make it up on the floor before the leaves come out on the trees, blocking all the sun. Now, some of these are only here for a short amount of time. Some last for a couple of months, maybe a couple of weeks, and a few only a couple of days. In late April through May, Virginia bluebells take their turn in the sun. I think this is one of people's favorite blooms because it checks a lot of our boxes when it comes to our senses. So visually, it's a bigger flower that comes up to our knees versus a lot of the other blooms are lucky if they come up to our ankles. They are also a beautiful blue color with a memorable shape of a bell that can like swing in the wind. And if you want to use your nose, smelling these bluebells will get you a nice sweet smell. Watching this plant grow from start to finish is a fun transformation to follow. These bluebells start as tiny little dark green, almost purple leaves with tiny purple buds. As the weeks continue, they grow lighter, greener, that stem starts growing taller and eventually curves down, and you'll see wrinkly pink buds that are starting to get that bell shape uh, form. Then once it's ready to bloom, it turns a blue, and then as it fades out through its cycle, it goes back to pink. Some of these blooms will stay pink the whole time, some are white, some are a mixture. It's always fun to see what will bloom next. If you are still and silent, you may have a chance to hear the action in all the Virginia bluebells. Bumblebees love to visit, buzz, and bounce around from bloom to bloom. And if you're lucky, you may even hear the humming of a hummingbird checking out the long tubes. The shape of the flower also attracts butterflies and moths that have long proboscises. Now, for the bees that don't have long tongues, they use a different strategy. You might find little holes drilled into the tubes, and that's because their tongues aren't long enough to get the nectar. Now, even though they're sort of cheating the system, by visiting and bouncing the flower around, the pollen still gets spread. I encourage you to bring bluebells into your own yard. They like wetter areas, and the preserves we see them along the creek banks and in lowlands. Plus, they like shady areas. Now you can't take them from the forest preserve, it's actually illegal, but I do encourage you to look for your native nurseries and plant cells. There are a few types of trilliums in our preserves, and they all follow the rule of tri or three. So they have three leaves, three sepals, which are the leaves that kind of hold the flower, and three petals. This particular one is probably the most common throughout all of our preserves, and it's called a prairie trillium. A little tricky because it's not really found in the prairies, it's a woodland trillium. It has these maroon color flowers, and in my experience, when you have a maroon flower, it smells mm -hmm, like rotting meat, kind of odorous, because it's trying to attract flies and beetles that would go after like dead animals. Another famous flower for messenger woods is the great white trillium, seen right here. 
Now still following that rule of three, it's got three leaves, three sepals, three petals, but this one's one of the largest ones and it stands up tall on its stem looking out. There's another trillium called nodding that has a big flower, but it kind of nods down. Now this flower is a favorite among deer. Deer usually eat these blooms before they can even do their reproduction to further their growth. So these flowers are really special when you see them because it kind of takes them a long time to get established. Another something I'm seeing is little insects chewing these petals. Now that's an okay sign. The flower's job is to be here for the insects and have that relationship. So these flowers are growing strong. Come mid-May and late May, wild geraniums take their turns and will blanket the floors now in pinks. Now you may be familiar with geraniums because they're a common ornamental plant, but these are the wild versions and they're great for all sorts of pollinators, flies, bees, even beetles and ants. And what's fun is when after they're done with their flowers, their seed turns into a crane bill. It's another name for the plant called cranes bill and it dries out and when it dries out, the seeds actually catapult through the air far away from the parent plant to start the next generation. This next flower isn't a typical blooming flower. This is Jack in the pulpit. This flower um, has more of a protective space, which is the pulpit. And then underneath you'll find Jack, which is a spadix, a club structure that holds the actual flower down below protected. It gets pollinated by flies that will kind of crawl in here, do their business and fly out. A fun fact about Jack in the pulpit is that it can change genders from year to year. So it has both parts, the male and female flower, but depending on the nutrients and the habitat quality, it can either be a male and store up energy or be a female with enough energy to make all the seeds for the next generation. This Jack in the pulpit is a male. And how I can tell that is because it has the flower and one leaf popping up. Now when I say leaf, this whole thing is considered a leaf. These individual ones are leaflets. So it has three kind of leaflets but all attached onto like one leaf. And then all these other little guys are probably new Jack in the pulpits that are just waiting to gain enough energy to make the flower. Another blue flower that gets mixed in with the bluebells is called Blue-Eyed Mary. It's different than a lot of our other ephemeral wildflowers because Blue-Eyed Marys are annuals versus perennial. So annual means that it has to reseed itself every year versus having roots to grow back from. So these blue-eyed marys will get pollinated, produce a seed. The seed actually germinates in the fall, starts growing a little bit, then will pause for the winter and then burst through the ground in the spring, ready to start the cycle all over again. Blue-eyed marys have a unique coloration. They have two white petals on top and three blue petals on the bottom. Now, with a first glance, it looks like two, but once the bee lands on it, that third petal kind of holds up the pollen and helps it dust the bee. This next plant is one from Magical Fairy Tales. One of the names it's known by is American Mandrake. So if I have any Harry Potter fans out there, Mandrake may sound familiar. The early Europeans thought it looked like their European mandrake, but actually there's no relation and when you pull out the root, it is not a crying baby that screams when it needs to be repotted. Another uh, more common name that it's known for is May Apple. It's easy to remember because it blooms in May and forms an um, apple after pollination. Now this apple is also a magical tale. It reminds me of Snow White and the poison apple. If we eat it at the wrong time, you can get very sick, you could go in a coma, even death. <laughs> However, wildlife can sniff it out and know when it's just the right ripeness to eat. Deer love it, box turtles eat it, they're one of the main dispersals of seed because they'll eat the apple and then poop it out. Plus other omnivores take advantage like raccoons and possums. Like our other spring wildflowers, it takes a long time to get that first bloom. So you'll see some of these may apples just have a single leaf. And then if it has two leaves, it will have the flower underneath, hiding below. It can take up to 12 years just to get the first bloom. When you see may apples, chances are you just don't see one. 
They grow in these large colonies. Now, something to note is that this is all still just one plant. This is a whole organism that just starts from one seed. Now, even though it may have a flower here and a flower here, it's still gonna need help from another colony to get pollinated. We can also try to age these colonies by using some facts. So we know it takes about 12 years for a flower to bloom. It also grows about four to six inches a year. So a colony this size, it's about 10 feet. So imagine like a 10 by 10 bedroom. Knowing a little bit of math, we can estimate that this colony is about 35 years old. So much life springs up in May. From the showy bluebells to the unique Jack in the pulpits, all these plants have a fine-tuned plan. They wanna grow fast before the leaves hit the trees. They wanna get pollinated and then they sleep until the next spring. Watching these relationships can be so much fun. And remember, you can bring these plants into your own yard. So consider planting natives for colors at all the seasons. You can start with bluebells and geraniums in the spring, move to cone flowers in the summer, and end with asters in the fall. That way you'll have color all year round and support the pollinators. Summer is here, so go ahead and make a splash with your friends. Kayaking is a perfect activity whether you prefer the wide open water of a fishing lake, an upstream paddle in a flowing river, or the calm of the I&M Canal. We have plenty of scenic places sure to float your boat. Embrace a sense of adventure. Take your time to check out wildlife along the way. There are new surprises around every bend. The open water is calling your name. Make this year be the one you get out and explore Will County's waterways. Grab your kayak, round up a few friends, and soak up the summer fun. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org. flowers are blooming, the frogs are croaking, the birds are singing. In spring, everything's a little louder and a little brighter. It's also the time that I can find my favorite animal. It's not very loud and it's pretty sneaky. When I have students with me out on a field trip and they roll a log, I'll hear screams and then quick, come look at this blue lizard. Well, it's not a lizard. I want you to meet the blue spotted salamander. Salamanders are amphibians like frogs and toads. The word amphibian means double life. This refers to their life cycle. They have to go to the water to lay eggs. So their babies, tadpoles for frogs, larvae for salamanders, will grow up in the pond, start swimming around, and then transform into adults. Once they're adults, they can generally live both in land and water. Salamanders get confused for lizards a lot of the time. So let's break down the differences. Lizards have scales and claws, while salamanders have smooth, moist skin and rounded toes. In the case of our blue-spotted salamander, they have dark bodies with blue speckles and spots along their sides, their bellies, and their tails. Males tend to be a little bit smaller than females with longer tails, but it's hard to tell unless they're side by side. Blue-spotted salamanders belong to the mole salamander family. This family tends to spend most of their time underground in tunnels. That's why it's a real treat to see them in spring. They're coming above ground to make their way to ponds to find each other to mate and lay eggs. Normally they will live in forests with down logs and leaf litter to find cover with a close pond nearby. These ponds tend to be ephemeral or temporary. The key is that they don't have fish in there to eat the babies. 
One of the coolest things about blue spot salamanders and all amphibians really is that they're indicator species. So an indicator species is something that when their presence is there, you know you have a healthy habitat. Amphibians can breathe through their skin and take oxygen up in the water. So if there's any pollutants in the water, it would not be good for them and they wouldn't be able to survive. So the fact that we have these special salamanders here means that we have high quality clean habitat. So let's keep it clean by picking up our litter and watching our fertilizer use. That way we can have healthy salamanders for years to come. One of the best things about researching wildlife is the partnerships we form. Organizations work together to gather knowledge and answers in hopes to help a species before it's too late. Today we're being joined by our wildlife ecologist, Becky Blankenship, who is teaming up with the Illinois Natural History Survey to start a study to learn more about our state-threatened ornate box turtles. Now these turtles are a little hard to find since they're great at digging and blending in with the environment, but we are not alone in our efforts. Joining the team will be John Rucker and his six dogs who are specifically trained to sniff out these turtles. He works a lot with the Illinois Natural History Survey and from April through August, he travels with his dogs starting up in Northern Illinois all the way down to Tennessee. Well, I was a high school teacher and I had some uh, retrievers in North Carolina and they spontaneously began br bringing Eastern box turtles to me and it became a hobby. Started getting requests for uh, people who wanted to track turtles. So I would catch them, the turtles with my dogs, and they would glue transmitters to the shells and they would <clears throat> track them and follow them and uh, study them. That's how this whole thing got started. The, these dogs are retrievers. They're actually Boykin Spaniels. They are the state dog of South Carolina and uh, they are heat tolerant. They don't mind going into blackberry thickets where they root like hogs for turtles. Uh, they are soft mouthed. They are uh, trained to be gentle on turtles. They are long lived. Uh, I have uh, some of my dogs are 13 years old and they still do a pretty good job for me. Let's take a moment for a little Turtle 101. This is Lilo, an education animal at Plum Creek Nature Center. He is an Eastern box turtle. Now all turtles are reptiles and they have a protective shell like this one and the top of it is called a carapace. The bottom of it is called a plastron and these individual squares or plates are called scutes. The scutes are made out of keratin which is like the material of our fingernails. Lilo is an eastern box turtle, which is similar to the ornate box turtles we're looking for today. All box turtles are land turtles or terrestrial, so you won't see them really swimming in the water. They also have this special hinge that allows them to completely close in their shell. Water turtles can go in their shell, but they don't have this hinge here to close up the door. There's a few differences between an eastern box turtle and the ornate box turtles. Ornate box turtles are supposed to be a little smaller in size, and they have a flattened uh, carapace instead of this full dome. They also lack this keel that Lilo has, this ridge on the top of his shell that goes all the way down his back. The biggest difference is habitat. Ornate box turtles live in sandy grasslands, where eastern box turtles live in forested habitats. Eastern box turtles are not listed as endangered or threatened in our state. However, the ornate box turtles are listed as state threatened. Our hope is to gain more information about their population, their movements, and their nesting success so we can learn better ways to manage their habitat.
Bingo, we found an ornate box turtle. We're gonna put it in a bag and mark its location so when we're done measuring and taking data, we can put it exactly where we found it. But until then, the search continues. You may notice once they find something, the dog's tails really are wagging and they're full of energy. Looks like they're gathered around something and it's a snake. They found an Eastern hognose snake, which also calls this area home. These snakes are famous for their behavior. To scare off predators, they flatten out their heads to make them look like a venomous snake, even though they don't have venom themselves. It's important to study the box turtle because they were contemporaries of the, of the dinosaurs. And when they plowed under the grasslands to grow corn and soybeans, they wiped out 99.9% .9 of the ornate box turtles in Illinois. We are working hard to make sure that, they're, that they are around for future generations. The main goal is to figure out if this population is reproducing. So my priority is to tag females and track them to their nesting locations. That way we can see if they are laying nests, if anything is eating the nests, or if these nests are successful. We don't have a lot of data on these box turtles. The most recent study was in 2015. We found seven or eight box turtles that they tracked and developed home ranges for. So we would like to recapture and see if those home ranges have expanded, have changed. Um, if they are nesting, where are they nesting exactly? Uh, it's, there's a lot of holes in the data that we would like to fill with this research. So if we find out that these ornate box turtles are moving into habitats that we have restored, that means that our restoration efforts are going exactly how we want them to. It also means that we have to be more careful with our prescribed burns and take into account their hibernation um, habits. So if, if they haven't gone into hibernation yet, we can't burn the area that they're in. We would have to wait until further into winter. Now it's time to take some measurements and put on the transmitter. This turtle will also receive notches along its scutes. Each turtle gets a unique notch code, identifying that turtle for the rest of the study. These notches will heal over time. First, we secure the transmitter on the turtle shell. Then we'll add tape to make sure it doesn't move anywhere while it dries. Once it's dried, we remove the tape and then paint it black so it camouflages in with the turtle. Then we'll return it back to that flagged area. So it's really enjoyable to have a lot of people who support you and want your project to succeed and are curious about turtles, helping you find turtles um, especially with the help of the turtle dogs. It's great to have extra hands, extra eyes, extra noses um, in order to make this, this project succeed. It's, it makes my heart happy. <laughs>
from flowers to turtles and even sneaky salamanders, nature can be one huge scavenger hunt. Sometimes it's good to know where to look, but also when. And that's why living in the Midwest is so exciting because with each changing season, there's something new to look for. So what are you waiting for? It's your turn to map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find out what's happening right now out in the preserves and at our facilities. So I hope to see you taking a moment to stop and smell the wildflowers. But until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.